Well, welcome to Season 2 of the Six Lessons Approach Podcast. I'm Dr. David Alleman. I'm excited to be back for another season. Before we get started, I have Season 1 giveaway winners to announce. We had so many participants that we selected two winners. Congratulations to Briam and Mark. We'll be contacting you on Instagram to get your SLA swag. Now, for episode one of the new season. We want to introduce the concept of why restorations fail. The restoration failure is what drove me to quit dentistry. I was a dentist for 17 years. I did traditional dentistry to the best of my ability with fillings and crowns and root canals. And I had failures. I had failures sometimes very quickly in the first three years. Then I would have some failures that would be a little longer, seven years perhaps, and then 10 years. But after 17 years, I had seen enough of my own failures to wonder, is there a way to prevent the failures? I know that I did my best, but could I have done it differently? And so those questions were never answered until I was connected with adhesive dentistry in 1995. And the adhesive dentistry that I was connected with came from Japan, and it talked about sealing the tooth. And the idea of sealing the tooth made sense to me because even before I went to dental school, I was very well aware that decay was from bacteria. Bacteria could be sealed out of a tooth if you had a seal that was small enough. Bacteria are on the micron level. If you look at your fingernail, that's an average fingernail thickness is 500 microns. And so you could be able to fit 500 bacteria across your fingernail. That's how small they are, but that's the cellular level. Bacteria are a cell, and those cells have shapes and sizes, and they have structures inside of the cell, just like every cell in our body has cellular elements. And so as a microbiologist, my major, I understood that level of size. And then as a chemistry minor, I understand that below the cellular level, you have molecules. Every cell works on a molecular system that produces energy and produces and reproduces the cell. And all of these chemical reactions that are on the molecular level, they have a new level of smallness, not the micron level, but the nanometer level. So a nanometer is 1,000 times smaller than a micron. And then molecules are made up of atoms, and the atoms are on a scale that is called angstrom. An angstrom is one-tenth of a nanometer, so ten-thousandths of a micron. But in the world of dental failure, it's always on the micron level. Microleakage allows bacteria to get in. And the best crowns or the best fillings that I could ever do had been shown in the research that I was discovering to be at about 25 microns. And so the best crown that I could ever do would still have the ability to have 25 microns living underneath it. But most crowns with most techniques would be around 100 to 200 microns under function. Well, If the bacteria are what causes re-decay, then if you're able to seal out the bacteria so they can't touch the dentin, then that has a possibility of stopping the decay process. And so as I was being introduced to adhesive dentistry and the idea of sealing a tooth, which we call a bond, the idea is that if you could stay bonded, then you could stay uninfected. Wow. That was a real game changer in my mind. And when I was introduced to that concept by Ray Bertolotti, because he had a PhD in chemistry and I only had a minor in chemistry, I respect that at least he knew what an atom was and then he knew what a molecule was. But sometimes chemists don't know that a biological entity like a cell is different than an airplane wing or, you know, a car fender or some material made out of molecules. and is used for different applications. But Ray Bertolotti, you know, he's a smart guy and his expertise in ceramics led him into the research field of ceramo metal crowns, PFM crowns. He was an expert in the world on how to make ceramic bond to the metal cores underneath the ceramic crown. That was his expertise. But because he was in the world of research, he came across 
a group of researchers in the mid 60s out of Japan that were talking about these ideas of bonding, which we've talked about in an early session, emerged in dentistry based on epoxy chemistry uh, from the late 30s into the early 50s. 1951 was the first bonding system, the first molecule that polymerized and bonded to a tooth was called Severton, and Severton had uh, a molecule called GPDM. But then in the 70s and 80s, new chemistries were introduced, and the ones that came from Japan had proprietary molecules, had proprietary solutions, had proprietary concepts of how to establish the bond the bonding systems for America, we just made them simpler and we had good marketing. And so we sold them to dentists and I bought them. They didn't work. They didn't bond to dentin. They didn't stop recurring sensitivity or decay. It was pretty, uh, pretty much not truth in advertising. You know, if somebody tells you something in advertising, the basic rule of economics is beware. If you're the buyer, the seller is just trying to get you to buy their material. So I suffered through that in the 80s and uh, knew that adhesive bonding was not really great. Interestingly enough, I had a connection with English dentistry established when I was a junior in high school because I was an exchange student and lived with a dentist in England. And because I was a dent, became a dentist, we stayed in contact uh, from 1968 to 1982. And the dentist who I lived with sent me some material that had the uh, <laughs> had the uh, label. This is what it was called, Miracle Mix. <laughs> so Dr. Parsons sent me some Miracle Mix, and this was supposed to be an adhesive material that you could use for crown buildups. And it was glass ionomer. I barely knew what a glass ionomer was or could be. But this glass ionomer was made a little stronger with a mixture with amalgam particles. So it was black. Doesn't matter under a crown. But still, you know, I read the instructions. I use it for a buildup. And then a year later, the buildup fails. You know, so my exchange student, the dentist mentor in some ways. He was a great oral surgeon. He loved to extract teeth and make dentures for young people in England that would get free dentures. They did it when they were 18 or younger. I mean, this is crazy, but this is my introduction to real dentistry in a different country. But this miracle mix, glass ionomer, the GC was the company. Originally, it was SB. And then uh, GC bought the material in Japan and actually made it somewhat better. It had some bond to dentin, but uh, not enough to sustain uh, the forces of chewing. Okay, so more failures in the 80s as I'm a young dentist, a young family growing. I'm trying to make my living doing fillings and crowns and root canals. And as I saw these failures, the idea in 1995, when I've introduced the idea of sealing at the less than micron level, was very, uh, it's a paradigm shift. And that began an improvement in my dentistry was when I was introduced to adhesive dentistry because one of the failures of reinfection based on this micro leakage was very much based in the science. And the more I studied, the more I understood. And that went pretty well for about five years. I made the progress in adhesive science to know what the issues were in establishing a hybrid layer, what the issues were in producing materials that could produce these hybrid layers that could make a strong connection in the submicron world. But then after five years of success and progress in adhesive dentistry, then I encountered and came face to face with something that I knew was causing failure in my dentistry, and that failure was fracture. And so the fractures first had to be visualized. Now, the visualization of the infections, these micro leakages from bacteria was helped tremendously when I was able to carry z dye in 1997. It took me two years from the time that I heard about carry z dye between the time that I actually had in my hands that I could use it. And so for three years, I was very excited 
and learn some things and develop some ideas. And I, every year I would be mentored twice a year by Ray Bertolotti in Yosemite or Lake Tahoe. Sometimes he would come to Utah. So I probably attended 20 to 25 lectures in those um, five years. But I understood that cracks were not being addressed because I'd attended every lecture in adhesive dentistry. Nobody talked about cracks. I could see the results of cracks, but I couldn't see a crack until I was inspired by my mentor in endodontics, Steve Buchanan. Steve Buchanan was my class valedictorian at UOP. I was glad to graduate in the middle of the class, get on with my life. He was number one in the class. I had known him from the day before dental school started. We were in the same line to get our pictures taken for the yearbook. And so that's when I met Steve Buchanan. He later became the real innovator and real paradigm shifter in endodontics when he embraced rotary instruments, nickel titanium technology, and the concept, which was key, of chemical removal more than mechanical removal of pulp tissue. The dissolving of pulp tissue with his technique took time. It made endo slower, but it made it better. He also developed the concept of a patency file, which he taught me. And when I took courses from Steve, I was introduced to the microscope. And so at the end of 1999, I saw endo through a microscope at a course that I took with Steve at the university, the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, for two days. I was with the endodontists who were using microscopes, and we were introduced, and I bought a microscope. And so from the beginning of the year 2000, I could see things twice as good, three times as good than the loops I I was using before. And then the investigation visualization of cracks became the burning question because I knew that cracks had a beginning and had an end, but a catastrophic failure, you you couldn't intervene. If you had a mid-roof fracture, the tooth was lost. But now with a microscope, I could see smaller cracks. I could see the cracks had a direction. Were they vertical? Were they horizontal? Were they oblique? And so as I started to investigate the crack principles, the only literature that was available was uh, engineering literature. And so I had a close friend, Dennis Groh, who was an engineer, bachelor's degree engineer, but he had on the job training in fracture mechanics crack propagation, crack stopping, because he was working his whole career on carbon fiber airplane wings, nose cones uh, at Hill Air Force Base for the United States government. So he had advanced (laughs) practical experience with cracks developing on these multi-million dollar aircraft. And as I talked with my friend Dennis about this and other engineers, they would always say the same thing. If you have a crack, you need to treat the crack. You can't just bond over it. You will need to actually dissect it or somehow interrupt the crack at the tip. I mean, that was the terminology they used. And of course, they used magnification and they used adhesive and fiber technologies to bond these dissections after they had removed the crack. But first, they had to remove the crack before they bonded over it for the repair. And then other technologies that weren't composite technologies like metal technologies, they had the same philosophy. And they found out that if they did dissect the crack and they did weld the crack, now they had actually a repair that could be twice as strong as the pipe that had fractured, started to fracture. I mean, all of these things, when you're not an engineer, it's new terminology, but I would buy textbooks that were less mathematical, less technical written for people who weren't engineers, but worked with materials that were prone to crack. And these books would still reinforce the idea that all of these cracks start on the submicron level. So the movements that actually broke materials made of molecules, the movements were on the nanometer level. Well, this seal that we're trying to seal the bacteria out is at that level also, submicron, nanometer seal, will keep micron-sized bacteria out. How about the micro-movements? The micro-movements were on the same scale. Micron-movements were earth-shaking to molecules because a micron is 500 times bigger than a molecule. And so if you have something shaking small things that is large, these micro-movements that we have in teeth regularly are like earthquakes to the atoms 
But after an earthquake, you can still settle down. And so you'd have this shaking, and then it would settle down. You have the shaking, it would settle down. Every time a tooth is bitten on, we have about three microns of movement spread throughout the tooth. Now, the tooth is nine millimeters wide. So three microns shaking, it's not a lot. But on the atomic level, it is. But the tooth has the ability to withstand these movements and then come back to normal. So it expand, come back to normal, expand, come back to normal. But if the movements were too big, then a crack would initiate. So once the movements got to be micron level and you had a gap into the tooth, which traditional restorations of fillings inside a tooth or crowns outside the tooth, there is always a gap of 25 to 200 microns, whether it's a crown or a filling. Those were the measurements that were being produced. And some of the most specific measurements were coming out of Pascal Manier's lab and his connection with the Procedonis Urs Belser. They were very exciting to read. I remember the article that I read in 2007 by Urs Belser, a finite elemental analysis uh, using engineering technology to show where stress concentrations were. Five years later, these stress concentrations were actually given a size by work done by Kevin Ogunasayan working in Pascal Magny's lab and published. And all of a sudden, we see that this expansion of a normal tooth of around three microns distributed over the whole tooth. If you had a filling in it, that expansion of three microns went to 175 microns opening. So that would be 100 microns on each side of a silver filling or 200 microns underneath the crown, as the crown is not compressed, which is ideal, but usually a crown is torqued. And so that torquing, where there is not a support of the tooth to the crown, leaves a gap, and that gap allows bacteria to come in, but also allows cracks to begin because of the movements causing the stress to the molecular level which can cause the molecules to separate, and that's called crack initiation. And then that crack initiation, when it's there, then it becomes aggravated at a faster rate the larger the crack gets until finally something falls off, a crown falls off, which for the first 17 years of my career, I saw crowns in the hands of the patients. Now, for the first 10 years, those crowns that were done, that were in the hand of the patient that wanted it fixed, we're done by another dentist. So it's like, well, that's obvious. That crown wasn't done the right way because my crowns don't fall off. I mean, I'm so, you know, I, I don't want to be proven that I'm not a good dentist. So my rationalization is always, well, this failure was somebody else's failure. And then on 10 years and one day, my crown started falling off, cracking, and the tooth was inside the crown. And I'm going, that crown was. Had a good marginal seal. I cemented it properly. I had the buildup properly done. And now this crown, there's nothing on top. Maybe I can reattach it to the root. But then sometimes the fractures would go not take the crown off horizontally, but they would go vertically into the root. And then at that point, the crown couldn't be even redone in any, in any uh, way. The, the tooth was lost. And so... About this time, 1995, when I'm introduced to a way to improve dentistry through solving the problem of reinfection, after five years, now the second major problem in my clinical practice was fractures that caused at least the, the need for a retreatment, but in several times, many times, it was a catastrophic failure. And then beginning that intense literature review on micromovements and engineering concepts from 2000 to 2003 under microscope, then I developed really the missing link, which is lesson two. And so both lesson one and lesson two are failures on the micron level. But if you can have a seal or a tooth that's connected on a nanometer level, by eliminating the decay in the peripheral areas and eliminating cracks in the peripheral areas, that's like a tooth. A tooth is connected side to side, front to back, and top to bottom on the nanometer level. And that's been the goal of biomimetic restorative dentistry and the six lessons approach since I started teaching it over 20 years ago. But again, 
you know, most dentists aren't really that interested in chemistry. They're not interested that interested in, in dental anatomy, which to me is like, are you kidding? You're a dentist. You should know some very important details about teeth. And if you have to learn some protein chemistry to understand collagen, then that's what you should do. If you have to understand some inorganic crystallography to understand hydroxyapatite crystals and how they interact with these collagen molecules so that they're tough, well, I think that's what we should do. That should be the basics in dental school. But unfortunately, it is not. We do not have a sophisticated dental curriculum in chemistry. We do not have a sophisticated dental school curriculum in dental anatomy, but that could change. And we think it's changing because dentists who understand the difference and what at stake to prevent failures, you have to prevent microleakage and micro movements. So by preventing micro leakage, lesson one, micro movements, lesson two, you're on a strong foundation to have a sound foundation that mimics a natural tooth. And on that sound biomimetic foundation, we can recreate a biomimetic restoration of the missing tooth structure that's been lost from fracture or decay. So that's season two, episode one. Until next time, get bonded, stay bonded. <laughs>